Good morning. Good morning. Isn't it good to be in the house of the Lord today? Amen. We stand with me as we sing our call to worship, Majesty. All right, it's good to have you. <laughs> yeah, we're glad to be here. Or not? Can, let's see, can you hear me? Is that on? Is that on good enough? It's good to have each one of you this morning. We are thankful to be here today. Uh, let me start off by reading this thank you card. It says, thank you for the kind words of love, your thoughts and prayers, and the food that was provided during the loss of our dad, husband, granddaddy, and great-granddaddy. We love you all and are so blessed to have you in our lives. God bless you. And that's from the Harold Rhodes family. Some of you, I'm sure most of you know that this past uh, Thursday we had Harold's funeral. So uh, continue to keep that family in your prayers when you pray. Uh, by way of announcements, let me announce that tonight we're going to be having a baptism. We're going to be baptizing Leah Elkins tonight at 6 o'clock in the Family Life Center. So we'd love to have each one of you come out. We'll have a good time. It'll be a good celebration. We'd love to have you. Uh, by way, uh, are, are there any other announcements of any kind? Thelma Walker passed away this morning about uh, 1.30 or so, so keep that family in your prayers when you pray as well. September the 13th through the 16th, we're going to be having a revival. Uh, my brother-in-law, Mark Mayo, is going to be out here helping us with it, so be praying for that. Get that uh, wrote down on your calendar. We would uh, greatly appreciate it, just the support of it. All right. What about prayer requests? Any prayer requests of any kind this morning? Uh huh. Okay. Okay. Uh huh. Uh huh. Okay. Yeah, Jeff and Teresa Eckham. We need to pray for. Continue to pray for their family. What they're going through. We do. Continue to pray for our leaders in our country. Absolutely. Somebody else? Okay. All right. Jody Walden. Remember him when you pray? Yeah. Those dealing with, suffering with cancer right now. Okay. 
All right, uh, unspoken, Lord knows our, everything going on in our minds and our lives. If you'll stand to your feet and bow your head. Let us go to the Lord with a word of prayer this morning and uh, take this time to kind of separate ourselves and uh, from the things that are going on in this world and the heartaches and the disappointments and the things that might be uh, going on in our lives and allow ourselves to come into the presence of the Lord this morning and just to be present with Him. So if you'll bow your heads, let us pray. Father, we thank you for this time together and for the opportunity to be here this morning. Lord, we know that you love us. We know, Father, that you've blessed us. And, Father, we know that your Holy Spirit uh, has led us here today. And we know that it's very present with us today. And, Father, we ask you to, to be with these, Lord, that are dealing with loss right now, these that are dealing with heartache, these that are dealing with difficult things that are going on in their life. We ask that you comfort them and that you would help them. And, Lord, these that are sick that's been mentioned for the unspoken request, that we have you up on our hearts, Father, the, the private things, the personal things that we deal with. We ask that you would that you would help us, that you'd give us guidance and help us to make right decisions in difficult times. And, uh, and Lord, you know what's going on in all of our lives, and we just we, we pour it out in front of you today. And, Father, we ask that your spirit would be with us during this time of worship. And we, uh, we just give you this time as we pull away from the distractions that the world offers. We bring ourselves into your presence. And, Father, we just want to lift up your name this morning above every name. And in Christ's name we pray, amen. If you'll remain standing, we'll let the choir continue to lead us.
take up our tithes and offerings. bow your heads, let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you once again this morning and we ask for your blessing upon this offering. Father, we ask that you uh, bless it in a way that only you can and we ask that everyone that gives this morning gives with a cheerful heart and Lord, you know the, what we, uh, the, the proper direction and the way, to, the way to use it and we ask that your spirit would lead us in that and we just give it to you and, and with all that we are in Christ's name. Amen.
At this time, if you'll stand to your feet uh, while the choir makes their way down, let's take this time to welcome some folks around us and let somebody know that you're glad they're here and you're glad to be here.
It is good to be here this morning, and we are glad to have each one of you with us. Thankful for the opportunity and the day that we've been, been given to come out. It is always good to see you. It's, it's good to see Miss Betty Hooks back with us this morning. We have certainly missed her. So we are, we're thankful that, that she's out, out with us this morning. But we are glad to have each one of you. Uh, this morning we're going to take a little, uh, I'm sorry. Okay. I lost his wife a couple of weeks ago. She's on her Okay. All right. Well, it's great to have you with us. Absolutely. Sorry for your loss. Uh, this morning we're going to take a little different approach. I, you know, I kind of explained, and I don't know if I'll go in quite the explanation here as I, I, I did earlier. I don't know exactly how necessary it is, but I'm, I will for a little bit. Uh, when I begin to get ready for, say, a sermon on Sunday morning, you know, it's, 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 it's a process. I know sometimes it don't sound like much of a process uh, the, with the result of it, but, but it really is a process that, that I kind of go through over a number of weeks, I guess you would say. Uh, you know, and what I, what I usually do is, you know, in time of prayer and, and study, I, I'll wrestle with a particular passage in the Bible uh, you know, for two or three weeks, and during that time, preparing for two or three different sermons along the way. And, uh, and the reason I wrestle with it is for the sake of interpretation. You want, you want proper interpretation uh, before you need anything else. You know, if you don't get right interpretation, it doesn't, you can come to all sorts of skewed application about what the Scripture says if your interpretation within itself is messed up. So one of the things that I do is the first thing that I wrestle with when it comes to particular scripture is interpretation. And I don't care if it's, you know, John 3.16 or, you know, a, a random passage out of Leviticus. You, you need proper interpretation because once you do that, usually the application of the passage presents itself. It, it doesn't, usually that, the stretch is not trying to figure out what it means to us. The, the, the hard part is trying to understand what it's saying to us. Because once we can determine that, we can usually draw the lines pretty easy about how to apply this or what this means to us today. So over time, we, we wrestle with it and we, you know, begin to write it out and different things along that line. And, uh, and then as we get closer to the, to the actual Sunday that we're going to preach it or talk about it, uh, we, you know, we begin to fine-tune it and put a little PowerPoint together and things along that line. And, and we've done that, uh, for, you know, for years. I mean, I've literally got... Uh, shelves and boxes and garbage bags full of those uh, notebooks, you know, those just note, college-ruled notebooks type stuff that were all these sermons have been wrote down. And, uh, and, and this Sunday was no different, and, but every now and then we have one of those Sundays where, you know, regardless of what you've been working on, you really feel the Lord just kind of change directions on you. And, uh, and, I, and I think we all know what that is. I think we've all probably got up before with good intentions in mind about our day and what we're going to get done and what we need to get done. And before you come to the close of the day, you find that, you know, that God has led you in directions that you never had intended on going that day. But whatever the case is, you know, we are His and we belong to Him. And it's His decision to, to guide us and direct us and, and, and what we get involved in and what we don't get involved in. We, we just submit. We're servants to Him. So, uh, so this morning, we're going to take a little different direction than what I had uh, initially planned. And we're going to talk about repentance for a minute this morning. Uh, Wednesday night, we started a, a new series. Uh, it's a video series about repentance. It's about a psalm that, where David repents. And, uh, and the, the study is going to take us through all the ideas and the issues and the, uh, just the weight of repentance, what it is, what it sounds like, how do we accomplish it. Uh, and we're, we're doing that currently on Wednesday night. This past Wednesday night was the first night. This coming Wednesday night will be our second night dealing with it. But uh, before we talk about that, let me, let me say, if you remember a few Sundays back, a few Sundays back I talked about, you know, the current moral condition that we find ourselves in within our own culture and our own society today. And, and you don't, there again, have to be any kind of psychologist or theologian to see uh, the morality of our country and our own communities just kind of withering away. And, and everything, it seems to be, uh, if you can justify it in any capacity, then it must be okay. Uh, that, that seems to be where we're at and the direction that we're headed. And so a few, a few weeks back, we talked about 
the church's role and responsibility in how we got to where we're at today because the church is not innocent in where we find ourselves today. You know, we, we talked about that. And, and when we said that, I mean, you can read through the Bible and, you know, if you find a, a healthy church within a community doesn't tear a community down. It, it generally builds it up. You usually don't find throughout the Bible when the children of Israel was in a good relationship with God, you usually found that the place they dwelt and the country that they were at and everything where they were at was usually flourishing. What you don't normally find is you don't find a place falling apart with a healthy body of Christ in the middle of it. You don't find that. that that's, that's not in the Bible. We don't find that uh, in the Old Testament. We don't find it in the New Testament. If you go into somebody's home and that home is falling apart from the inside out, you're probably not going to find a good, stable, spiritual group within that home. It's just the truth of the matter. Because a good, stable, spiritual family within the home, anchored within the home, doesn't tear a home down. It strengthens it. It makes it stronger. It becomes more of what God desires it to be and less of what this world tries to do to it. So if we find ourselves in a time and within a land and and our current context of where morality's sake, things are just unpeeling and coming undone and, and falling apart to where you can't even so much as watch a commercial on TV anymore, uh, or anything along the line, or scared to death to even turn your radio on about what you're going to hear. And, but when, when you find that going on in the land and it's being accepted within our culture, then you can just about guarantee that there's a spiritual problem with the body that lives in that land. I don't, I don't think that's a secret of any kind. So a few weeks ago, we talked about pulling ourselves back from the things of this world. You know, we talked about separating ourselves from the ways of this world, about from the ways of which we find entertainment to the ways of which we think things are right and wrong to all sorts of different things, just trying to establish ourselves as people who are not of this world. Although we live in it, it doesn't mean we have to be a part of it. We don't have to accept it. We don't have to look like it. We don't have to act like it. We don't have to sound like it. We don't have to give in to the same things that... Uh, that this world gives to. We, and, and, and what I talked about was just pulling back and separating ourselves and, and, and deciding to not be a part of the things that are going on in this world. Well, it, it takes more than that. You know, and it takes more than just deciding to get rid of idols in our life. I mean, it, it takes more than that. It takes more of us just waking up one morning and deciding to tear down an idol that maybe has been in our life for a long time. And I don't care what that idol is. I don't care if it's, you know, uh, too much attention to work or too much attention to ourselves, or you know, if, if we live for you know entertainment purposes or hobbies or whatever. I don't I don't care what the idol is. You don't just get up and decide to tear it down and then it's not there in your life anymore. The only way that you can get rid of an idol like that is you have to replace that idol in your life. In other words. To break down those idols and to, and to pull back from those idols that it seems like the spiritual church in America has given itself to, then it, then it has to replace those idols with the one true God in its life. You know, you can get up today if you want to and you can decide wholeheartedly that all this wrong stuff you're going to fix. You, know, you can decide that you're not going to, you know, that this is not going to be top of your priority anymore. That this is, you're not going to live for this purpose. And, and while you might be able to make it a few days or a few weeks, something is going to take its place. So you, you just don't get up and tear down idols. In the Old Testament, we find when repentance was called for, it wasn't a simply a pulling away from idols or a tearing down of things that were worshipped, but it's really a call to repentance before you ever begin tearing down idols. When, when Jonah makes his way into Nineveh, you know, Jonah doesn't go in there and point out all the idols and say, you've got to get rid of these idols. But Jonah goes in there and he calls the people to repentance because of judgment. You know, and, and because of that, not knowing how people would respond, the Bible says that the people in Nineveh, that they, that they all agreed together to enter a time of repentance. They see even to the point where they put their animals up and wouldn't even let their animals graze or let their animals eat. I mean, they entered a very serious time of repentance. And we find that in the Old Testament. We find it through the way that God dealt with Israel. We find it in the New Testament as we, we're, we talk about things in the New Testament concerning idols and what we live for and the things that our lives revolve around. And so we can't just get up and we can't just decide we're going to step back from the things of this world and the things that are in this world, the first thing that's got to happen is actual true repentance needs to take place. 
before we decide. You know, we, we made some decisions in our home around that time about the things we weren't going to do anymore, you know, about the ways of which, uh, you know, we were going to allow entertainment within our home or the ways of which we're going to spend our evenings or the ways of which we're going to be a part of or the things we're not going to be a part of. And we made some decisions based on, based on our house. And while I believe those decisions are good, I think there has to be a time of where we repent for having to make these decisions now. Right? I mean, while it's wonderful for you to stop hitting somebody, you might want to tell them you're sorry for hitting them in the first place. Once we get, just stop hitting them, it's probably not going to fix it. You know, to restore the relationship, repentance has to be done. So we can't just get up today and say, we're going to stop bad. But there has to come a time within the life of the spiritual church and the, the spiritual community to repent for ever being in a situation such as this to begin with. I think it just makes sense. And, and I, think, I believe with all my heart that's what the Bible teaches. So today and over the next few weeks, in one sense or another, leading up to our revival, through our revival, and maybe a little bit past it, we're, we're, we're going to talk about repentance. We're going to talk about what it looks like, what it sounds like. We're going to talk about, in one capacity or another, the, the, the details of it. And we're going to encourage ourselves and you and the people that we're a part of to enter in and be a part of a time of repentance. There's nothing wrong with it. You're never going to walk into God's presence and hold yourself up to be something and ever have a relationship with Him. You, you just simply can't. So we've got to go through a time of repentance before we begin to start tearing down certain idols and ways of which we've become a part of the problem in the ways of which we've become a part of this world. So we're going to read a passage here that's in 2 Chronicles. And in 2 Chronicles, usually all you got to do is say 2 Chronicles and your mind immediately runs to this place. It's a, it's a pretty well-known passage. It's, I, don't, I don't think there's a whole lot of hidden stuff within it. You can get extremely deep in it with some of the language that's used. Uh, but, you know, if, if we miss the stuff that's on the surface of it, it's pointless. So... What's happening here in 2 Chronicles 7, Solomon has built the temple to the Lord. And for three or four or five verses leading up to this, he has consecrated the temple. He's prayed, he's offered sacrifice, hundreds of thousands of sacrifice. He's offered up to God and he's consecrated this place and he's made this a very special place, a place that's set apart, a place that's set aside and is inviting God into this place. And so we go through about three or four chapters of that, and then we get to the place in 2 Chronicles 7 of where God begins to respond to, uh, to Solomon, to Solomon's invite, I guess you will, this, this time of consecration. And this is God's response. And it's an interesting response, to say the least, because two things happen. Number one, God accepts the invitation to dwell there. He accepts the invitation to, to use this for His glory and for His kingdom and at the same time, he offers up somewhat of a warning for when, bad, when calamity comes, when bad things happen, when a nation turns against it. Here's what he says in verse 12. It says, Then the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said to him, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. When I shut up heaven and there is no rain, or command the locusts to devour the land, or send pestilence among my people... If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. It says, Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to prayer made in this place. Now, it sounds like verse 15 and, uh, verse 15 and 12 go together. It says, Then the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said to him, I've heard your prayer and I've chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive. In the middle of God accepting this invitation to make this uh, His house, there's a pretty stern warning with 13 and 14 because 13, He says, when I decide to close heaven, shut up heaven, and there's no rain and pestilences come and, 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 and things devour the land and all this stuff happens. In 14, He says, if my people who are called by my name, and then He goes into this. Now, for years and years and years, this particular verse in 14 has been somewhat of a kind of a, a revival battle cry. You know, probably ever, anybody that's ever preached more than one revival 
has always done one on you know Second Chronicles seven and fourteen. It's it's one. If the odds are you got a good chance if you go to revival service, you're going to hear Second Chronicles seven and fourteen at one point or another. But it's not just a call for revival. It's actually a call for repentance. Now, repentance and revival they do go hand in hand. But we're not talking about revival. That that's neither here nor there. We're talking about repentance. The, these things they are they are separate. But they do coexist and they do go hand in hand together. And here's the prescription or here's the ingredients of, of true repentance. And it's, it comes in verse 14 and he gives us four things to talk about. And he says that if the people will humble themselves, if they will pray, if they'll seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then it he'll hear from heaven and hear their lands. Now, a couple of things before we get into this. Understand who God's calling for repentance for the land to be healed. His people. Right? That's who he's calling. God is first calling for a healing of the land to take place is for His people to repent. It weighs on the back. The weight of repentance weighs on the back of His people for a healing in the land. Now, this is clear. So, he says, so here's what they need to do in order for repentance to take place. The first thing they've got to do is humble themselves. Now, let me say again as I go through this, I don't think that... You know, we can, we can mine this out and we can find a lot of diamonds way down deep, but there's a, there's a lot of fertile stuff right on top of the ground. And I don't, I don't think understanding what it means to be humble is very complicated. I think it's actually pretty simple. For me, understanding to be humble before God is, is simply said as understanding that He is God and you are not. I, I think that's step number one. You're never going to be able to find a place of repentance unless He is God and you are not. Plain and simple. And, and I don't mean He is God in the sense of we live for Him and not myself. We deny myself and, and, you know, and, and, and take the things of God. I mean understanding that when you're coming to Him in a time of repentance, understand to the best that your mind, our minds can that you're coming to an, to an, an all-powerful One that created everything. You're not strolling into the room with your buddy and discussing world events with him and things you are doing that you shouldn't be doing. You're not laying down on the bed of a in a room with a counselor and explaining your deepest, darkest secrets. You're walking into the room with the one that holds life and death into his hands. And regardless if you like that or if you don't like that, if you like his decisions or if you don't like his decisions, if you like the way he conducts the, uh, his role and his responsibility, or if you don't like it, it's neither here nor there. You're walking in, you're coming into the presence of one who is so much greater than ourselves. Amen. And that, that, that starts with humility. It's a breaking, it's not just bending a knee and bowing a head. It's not just a physical show of we are smaller than or we are less than. But it's a breaking of one's will. It's a breaking of one's heart. It's a breaking of one's own passions and one's own desires. And understand in this great chain exactly where we sit. Understanding that He is holy and He is righteous and He is perfect in every way. And all of our good deeds together will never be good enough to make us righteous before Him. Right? There's not a thing we can do that could ever be good enough to bring us in. I don't care if we've gone to church from the day we were born and we're 80 years old today and we've never missed a Sunday. We're still filthy creatures within this flesh in the eyes of God. Plain and simple. I don't care how many songs we've sung, how many sermons we've preached, how much our life revolves around religious work and religious activity, you're still coming into the presence of an extremely holy, righteous God. So for the children of Israel to repent, the first thing they got to do is get themselves off their own pedestal and understand, number one, that, they're, that there's nothing good about them except God and come into God's presence and identify the fact that He is God and they are not. Like I said, I don't, I don't know in any way, shape, form, or fashion. Uh, I don't believe for a second that this is something that we can't wrap our minds around. As a matter of fact, I'd go as far to say I believe it, it explains itself. The question is, is if we want to do it or not. That's always the question before it boils down to it. It's not, do we understand it? The question usually is going to be, do we want to do it? it the understanding part, generally pretty simple, especially when the Spirit's working. The, the question's always going to be, do we want to commit to it or not? So the first step to repentance is humbling, humbling ourselves, knowing that the God that we're about to come before and the God that we're repenting to, the one that we've done wrong, is one that can take us out, he said, do not fear the one that can destroy your body. What does he say? He says, you need to be afraid of the one that can destroy both body and soul in hell. Amen. 
Now, what does it do for us to say, with all of our brokenness and with all of our filthiness, that's the one we're coming before? You won't do it upright. I guarantee you that. There's a place in the Bible in the New Testament of where there's a prayer that takes place and there's two men praying and these prayers are compared one to another. Jesus compares them. He said there's a Pharisee in there praying, a very religious man, and there's a publican in there praying, a very filthy man. He says then the Pharisee prays of this man. He says he, he stands and he, you know, he, he boasts and he lifts his voice and he talks about all the great things that he's done. He says, I fast twice a week. I give tithes of everything that I have. I do this. I do this. I'm not like everybody else. I'm not like these filthy people. And then he compared the publican's prayer. And the publican's prayer was simply this. The Bible says that he beat upon his chest and he says, God, have mercy on me. Be merciful to me for I'm just a sinner. I'm just a sinner. Out of those two, out of those two men, one understood that he was not God and that he was praying to God while the other one held himself up essentially as God. The other one felt like because he had been good and he had done well and he had done all these religious rites and these religious activities and he had probably a good understanding of, of what the law said and carried himself and conducted himself and maybe was even looked up to within the community. Because he was so good, he didn't necessarily need to humble himself down quite as low as that sinful publican did. But Jesus said that the publican went away justified in the eyes of God and the other man did not. So if we're going to take our filthy, broken selves into the presence of the Almighty, we will not do it with a high mind. We will do it with a broken spirit and a broken heart. We will do it with a heart that's heavy. I would almost dare say we would, on, we would almost do it shamefully with, with what's within us. The second one is this, and I don't think the second one's a great mystery either. It says pray. Before they pray, there's a humbling that takes place. After the humbling is there, then the people must pray. And a prayer is simply crying out to God, especially a repentance prayer. Last Sunday night, we read a, uh, a psalm in here. I think it was maybe Psalm 142. And in that psalm, we find a place in David's life where David has, is, is running away from one who's trying to kill him. He ends up facing another one, and he has to act like he's a madman just to get away from this guy. Well, he gets away from this guy, and David's complaint is, nobody around me cares about me. Nobody around me lifts me up. Nobody around me is helping me. And we find David holed up in a dark cave. And the Bible says that in that cave, he cries out to God in that cave. You know, I, and I'm, I'm a firm believer that if we're going to humble ourselves and bring ourselves to the, before the throne of grace, that I believe you can't help but cry out. Uh, I don't think the type of prayer that it's calling for is one of where we bend our knees and we bow our heads and we apologize for acting in a bad way. I don't think that's it. I don't think it's an I'm sorry. Every now and then I'll get to my kids and they'll get in a fuss or get in a fight and I'll look at one of them and I'll tell them, you need to tell your sister you're sorry. Their response, I'm sorry. That's their response. I'll say, I'll tell Chloe, Chloe, tell Ruthie you're sorry. I'm sorry. They stomp off and go the other direction. For, for too long, the church has been that. That's been our repentance. It's been the preacher or the song or a Sunday school teacher saying, we need to repent. And everybody says, I'm sorry. And then we stomp off into the world just to do the exact same thing. That's what my kids do. They stomp off out and do the exact same thing. But every now and then, you know what usually changes the circumstances and what's a whole lot harder than saying, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's when I bring them together and I'll tell Ruthie, you need to hug your sister. Oh. That takes a lot more grit to, to hug up somebody than just offering up an I'm sorry. You know, and, and you have to threaten to throw Chloe off the top of the house to get her to hug her sister sometime. It's, it's, it's the breaking of a wheel. It's a breaking of a hardness. Repentance is not an apology prayer. It's not a statement of, I'm sorry for doing this, that, or the other. You know, the prayer that we pray during a time of repentance is a crying out. You know, it's a revealing. It's pulling back the curtains on our heart and confessing to God, here's what's here. You know, it's pulling back the curtain on our heart. It's opening up the doors to those dark closets and it's, it's digging up old garbage that's been there for years and years and years that we've refused to deal with, that we didn't want to admit, and that we didn't want to confess. It's pulling back those curtains and it's revealing to God, this is what I am. And it's pitiful. It's pitiful. I mean, this is what I am. These are the thoughts that I've got. I care more about myself than I care about other people. 
I'd rather have mine. Yes, I know on the surface I ought to be glad that somebody's getting baptized, but I'd rather watch my show at home. So let me tell you the ugly part of that when you pull it back. I really don't care if I go to heaven or not. Oh, that's a crying out. When you get sincere about why you do what you do, it won't be a simple apology. I guarantee you. It'll be a heartfelt pouring out before God. Then after the humbling and the prayer takes place, he says to seek my face. And seeking my face simply means to seek the presence of God. To live in the presence of God. To walk in the presence of God. To be devoted to the presence of God. Devoting yourself and devoting everything that you are to seeking out that presence, living in that presence, and existing each and every day, walking in that presence. It changes why you get up. It changes where your mind runs to when you do get up. It changes what happens when you get angry. It changes what happens when you get tired. It changes why you walk through the doors on Sunday morning. It changes why you sit down in the evening instead of uh, flipping the television on, you pick your Bible up. It changes everything. When you decide to seek the presence of God, it changes your radio channels. It changes your television channels. It changes your friends. It changes the places you go. It changes who you are when you decide to seek the face of God. Because you can't seek the face of God when you're completely wrapped up with the things of the world. You just can't do it. You can't seek the face of God if you're constantly garbage music that keeps being pumped into your mind. You just can't. You can't seek the face of God if you're going to sit around and watch these ridiculous reality shows day in and day out. How are you going to seek the face of God and at the same time you're wrapped up in, I don't know, Pawn stars. That's the only one I know right now. I haven't watched them in a while. How, how do you do that? Yeah, that's what I thought. Uh -huh. You watch them pawn stars, don't you? How do you do it? How do you do it? How do you sit down and watch you soap operas of the day and at night and, and, and killing and trying to figure out murder scenes? Cut it off and stumble into the presence of God. You can't. So... He says, you've got, to, you've got to diligently, with a heartfelt devotion, come after me in everything that I am. His presence, His power, His ability, and live there. It's not a visit. You don't visit it on Sunday morning. It's not a one-time passing through. But it's a place you find and you, and you live in that place. And the last thing, I don't think there's any explanation, much of an explanation needing at all and turn from their wicked ways. Simply put, it means this. We need to clean our lives up. I don't... I say we need to clean our lives up. I hope that I never take the stage and say that your salvation depends on you being and acting good. However, Jesus nowhere relieves us from trying to live holy lives before the Father. Nowhere does He say... You don't have to live good anymore because I make you righteous. Listen, Jesus makes us righteous simply because there is no good deed that can. But He still calls us to a different way of living. He calls us to change our mind. He calls us to change our affections. He causes us to change the places we even look. Set your eyes and set your affections on the things above and not on the things of this world. All of that changes. And so, so the, the last ordeal, we usually start with this, right? This is where we, we usually tell people we get up and, and we tell people to, to tear down their idols and walk away from their idols and turn from their wicked ways. But a lot more has got to happen before you get there because you can't get away from your wicked ways unless you humble yourself and you pray and you seek God. When those things happen, then you will be empowered to turn from your wicked ways. And when I say wicked ways, I mean anything that's outside of God's will. Apathy is wicked in the eyes of God if you don't care about the people around you. If you don't care about what's going on within your own spiritual life or your relationship with God or your service at church, if you don't care about that, that's as wicked as any cultural sin we can drum up. It's wickedness. You turn from wickedness. Gossip's wickedness. You know, spreading people's garbage is absolutely wicked. I don't care if it's true. Well, if it's true, it's not gossip. That's a lie. Now you're not just gossiping, you're lying. You got to turn from that garbage and clean your life up. Clean how we think, what we think about. Clean up our conversation. Clean up the ways of which we're entertained. Clean up our own desires. 
And like I said before, you're not going to get up tomorrow morning and decide to clean up all, clean your life up and go to bed with your life being clean. If you're going to clean your life up, you're going to get up, you're going to humble yourself, you're going to pray, you're going to seek His face, and then you'll be empowered to turn from your wicked ways. So while, while we, can, we can say, as we said a few weeks back, we've got to separate ourselves, we've got to pull back from the things of the world and, and become the people God's calling us to be. Well, I'm in agreement with that, but boy, there's some forerunners to that that we can't leave off. And first and foremost is repentance. It is repentance. So this morning, and over the next few times we gather, be it Wednesday nights, Sunday nights, and Sunday mornings, we're going to end with a time of repentance. I know it, you know, you think, well, we do that every Sunday. Not necessarily. Every Sunday we end with a time of response for whatever's going on in your life, whatever's happening. I mean, you may be so wrapped up in the trouble that you can't hear anything that's being said today and you just need time to pray. That's a, that's a response to what's happening in your life and things that are going on. We're not going to offer up that type of response. We're going to offer up a time of repentance. This is intent. We, this is the purpose of it. This is the reason for it. This is the time, this time, we're, uh, we're setting this time aside. It's for the simple sake of repentance. And so... What I can't do is, while I can make all of us probably say I'm sorry, or most of us, some of you may not, no matter what, while, while I you know, may be able to, to guilt and poke and prod everybody long enough to where everybody might say I'm sorry, I can't make anybody repent. I can't make you be honest about what's in your heart. I can't. I can't make you be honest about the guilt you feel over the ways you're living your life. I can't do that. I can't make you, you know, open those doors to those dark closets that only you and God know about. I I can't do that. But we can offer up a time for that. You know, we can offer up encouragement to do that and to say that, listen, God don't just call us to repentance. God desires for us to repent. He desires for us to humbly come before Him and know that He loves us enough that we can reveal everything that we are to Him and He's still going to love us. He's still going to love us. How many of you parents have sat down with your kids before and said, you can tell me anything? I bet all of you have done it one time or another. I've done it with mine. You know, when, when they're holding something back and it starts early because they don't want to tell mom and daddy what's going on. Luke come in from school Monday. I say, Luke, how was school? I'll tell you tomorrow. Tell me tomorrow. You're going to tell me now. I'll talk about it tomorrow, he said. You know, from, from little to teenage, don't we need to know that we can tell our Father anything and He's going to love us? Amen. God doesn't desire for us to come to repent so you can understand how rotten you are. God desires for us to come to repent so you can understand how much He loves you. Because even in all that you are, and all that brokenness that's there. And let me tell you, we all got a lot. He still loves you. Holding back and not repenting helps you in no way whatsoever. So this morning, we're going to stay right where we're at. We're going to stay within our seats. We got a, did they pass that song on to you, Jamie? They didn't give us a song? All right. Laura, if you want to come to the piano for me, if you don't mind. We're going to take time this morning, and we're going to encourage you Pull those curtains back. Pull those curtains back before God this morning and say, this is what I am. And this is who I am. I know you love me. I know you're calling me to this. Help me with this. Help me with this. And don't be afraid. Because I'm telling you, he, he knows it already. He's just waiting for you to confess it. So this morning, we're going to stay right where we're at. I'm going to say a word of prayer, and we're going to let Laura play. And you take this time, head bells, eyes closed, and we're going to take this time, and uh, we're going to take this time to repent. There's no fault in it. Simply stop doing bad is not enough. We need to repent, too. Let me pray. Father, we come to you right now, and we thank you for who you are. We know that you're with us. We know that you love us. And Father, there's been things in all of our lives that we've hid from ourselves because we didn't want to deal with it. We didn't want to talk about it. Father, we've, we've hid it from you. We've hid it from others. And we know it's there. And God, I pray right now that we take this time to be honest. 
that we pull back those curtains, that we open that, those doors of those closets, and <clears throat> we be honest about the things that we're wrestling with. If it's the way we feel about certain people in our life, Father, if it's the issues that we have with others around us or family or finances or addictions or whatever it is, well, we know that we, can, we will leave this conversation, this prayer with you loving us. And God, I pray that we don't hold back, but that your Spirit gives us the freedom to make those confessions today. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. As Laura plays, every head bow, every eye closed, let's take just a few minutes this morning. Go ahead, Laura.